Production funding for the Louisiana Governor's Debate 2019 is provided by Southern Strategy Group, supporting voter education and providing professional advice on the politics of business and the business of politics. With over 100 years of combined partner experience, navigating governmental affairs. Learn more at SSGLA.com and by the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting and viewers like you. Louisiana has a choice. Re-elect Governor John Bell Edwards for four more years or turn the reins of state government over to one of his challengers, U.S. Representative Ralph Abraham or businessman Eddie Rispone. Tonight, find out how the major candidates stand on the issues that are important to you. Live from the campus of the University of Louisiana in Lafayette, the Louisiana Governor's Debate 2019. Good evening, I'm Beth Courtney, President of Louisiana Public Broadcasting. Welcome to the campus of the University of Louisiana at Lafayette. Thank you for joining us tonight for this important debate with the major candidates vying to become the next leader of our state. We thank our public broadcasting partners statewide for also sharing this evening's program with their viewers and listeners. And I'm Barry Irwin, the president of Council for a Better Louisiana, and we appreciate everyone's participation tonight. We will de delve into a number of issues of importance to our state with the candidates for Louisiana governor. Participating in our debate are U.S. Representative Ralph Abraham, businessman Eddie Rispone, <laughs> and Governor John Bell Edwards. Well, thank you all for being here. And our panel of journalists include Natasha Williams, co-anchor and producer of LPB's Louisiana, the state we're in, Greg Hilburn, state political reporter for the USA Today Network newspapers, and Mark Ballard, Capital News Editor and Bureau Chief of The Advocate. A drawing was used to determine the order of questioning, and the format is designed to learn more about where the candidates stand on key issues. And this is how it'll work. Our panel of journalists will pose a question to the candidates, and each candidate will have one minute to respond. The panelists reserve the option to ask a follow-up question to ensure clarity and responsiveness in the answers. Candidates will have 20 seconds to respond to that. We'll also have one round where panelists will direct questions to a specific candidate, and another round where candidates will direct a question to a fellow candidate. And if time permits, there's going to be a lightning round with just a yes or no answer, and that will be directed to all of the candidates. Well, before we go on, many thanks to all of you who submitted questions for the candidates via email and Twitter. If you would like to see what others are saying about the debate or join the conversation, you may go to hashtag LAGovDebate on Twitter. We begin with an icebreaker question. An easy, a toss-up question, gentlemen. Uh, this is a question to all three of you. We live in an age where media and journalism in general have often become polarized and sometimes derided as fake news. We would ask each of you to tell us on a daily basis, where do you get your news? So let's go with you. Congressman Abraham. I get my news uh, from both print and social media. Okay. Well, what I do, I get up every morning around 4, 4.30, and I have my coffee and do my readings. Then I go up and exercise. And while I do that, I watch Fox News for probably 20, 30 minutes, and then I watch the local news for maybe 10 or 15 minutes. And then I go downstairs and have my breakfast and read the local newspaper. And that's where I get most of my news from. Uh, thank you for the question. And I'm going to answer it. But before I do that, I want to call everybody's attention to a tragedy today at Fort Polk where we lost wow. a soldier. Uh, and you will also notice around the state tomorrow, flags will be at half staff for Captain Liberto, who was a Mandeville police officer who was killed in the line of duty last week. And I'd ask everybody to keep them in their thoughts and prayers uh, and their families as well. Uh, I get my news primarily from the Morning Advocate and a variety of, of TV programs uh, around uh, the state uh, and, and on occasion, uh, CNN. All right. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thanks very much. And now we're going to go to our uh, panelists to begin the round of questioning. We start with uh, Greg Hilburn, who is going to pose a question to Mr. Rispone. And a reminder, the candidates have one minute to respond. Greg. 
Would you support calling a constitutional convention? If so, identify two areas you would change. For instance, our current constitution protects public school funding and other priorities. If you don't believe we need a convention, how would you approach issues identified as problems, like a lack of flexibility within the state budget? That's a very good question. Thank you, Greg. I do support a constitutional convention, and I think we need to do that to bring us in the 21st century. We have to make Louisiana competitive with the rest of the country, and that's where we start. And the articles I would definitely look at is revenues and taxation. We have to be competitive. We have to create jobs in Louisiana. And in order to compete, we need to have something done with our taxes and revenues. Another area that we'd have to work on would be our local government. We have to do something there because the local governments, particularly in the rural cities and towns, are really struggling. So there's some things that we have to do as well. So that's I am for a constitutional convention. We need to do something different than what we have today. Essentially, we have a body of statues and not really a true constitution convention, I mean constitution, where we, we really don't allow our elected officials to do their job and set priorities like we should. Only 11 percent of the budget is, is uh, available to them to make priorities and make the changes we need. Governor Edwards. I would, thank you for the question, Greg. I, I'm not in support of a constitutional convention. You know, a few years ago, there were a lot of people who thought that one would be necessary in order to allow us to solve our problems and achieve the stability that we've lacked for so long. But the fact of the matter is, we were able to come together under my leadership, Republicans and Democrats, create the stability that we need, uh, and we've been able to move forward. Uh, we are able, uh, and quite often we do, uh, we can change the Constitution through amendments, and I think that that's a better process uh, than a constitutional convention because, quite frankly, I don't think we need to be re revisiting things like higher ed governance or the right to hunt and fish in Louisiana uh, and, and other things of that nature. So the constitutional convention is not something that, that I support. Look, I'm not opposed to a constitutional convention, but I'm running to lead the state. And with a supermajority of fiscal conservatives, which I think we will truly have after the November election, we can move fiscal reform very quickly with a conservative governor and a conservative legislature. There is miscommunication that there is a such thing as a limited constitutional convention. There's not. So if you open that boy up, you better be careful because things like protecting the unborn, second rights amendments can be on the chopping block. Again, I'm not opposed, but it brings to mind a song by one of my uh, favorite artists, Elvis, Fools Rush In. We must be careful when we look at that con uh, opening a constitutional convention. What would, what would most concern you, even if, you're, even if you're in favor of a constitution, you do have to, these, the, the, the amendments, the things that are in the constitution now were passed by two-thirds of the legislature, had to be voted on by the people. So uh, they were vetted in a pretty comprehensive uh, system. So does that concern you at all? Can yes, sir, Mr. Spohn? No, it doesn't concern me. I think we have to be very deliberate when we have a constitutional convention. We can't take it lightly. We can't put it in the special interest and let them go crazy with it. But keep in mind now, the citizens of Louisiana are going to have the right to vote it in or not. So, and we're not going to let it go crazy. We're not going to do things that are not acceptable to our citizens. We just need to have a real constitution so we can be in the 21st century and do what's right. Any of the other candidates care to respond to that one? Well, Governor? look, I, I think Greg's point is well taken. Uh, the fact of the matter is uh, the biggest dedication, for example, in the Constitution is K through 12 funding in the minimum foundation program. Who's going to vote to cut the investment that we're making in, in K through 12 and in our children and their education. Um, and so we have to be really, really careful about opening it up and because there's just not a compelling reason to do it. Congressman? Oh, absolutely. What I do know is that with a legislature and a governor, you can rewrite one article. And we do need to talk about Article 7, taxes and, and, tax, and revenue. It's, it does need to be revamped. But again, we can do that with the right leader and a right legislature without putting on the chopping block those things that are actually important. Mark Ballard, you have our next question. Can I comment on that one second? No. Mark? Okay. 
But I think we can all agree that uh, Louisiana's roads are atrocious, and we have a $14 billion backlog and needed maintenance and road improvements and little money. So the question is simple. Where are you going to find the money to fix our crumbling highways? Governor? Uh, thank you for the question, Mark. You're right. We've got a, a backlog. It's $14 billion that's been accumulated over the decades. Uh, we do not have the resources that we need to tackle it. But we have been aggressive uh, and, and creative in the way that we are funding infrastructure in the state of Louisiana. I've delivered over $2 billion in projects for roads and bridges and ports. Uh, I've made sure that we've gone after Garvey funding, uh, bonding, for example, for the first time in our history to deliver high capacity uh, projects such as widening of I 10 in Baton Rouge and the uh, interchange at the Kenner Airport uh, and at Barksdale Air Force Base. Uh, we made sure that we're using the surplus uh, as non-federal match to intercept dollars that go back to Washington from other states that can't obligate the funds. Uh, and this year, I signed into law a $700 million investment in transportation infrastructure that will take place next week. First thing I did was made sure that we stopped funding unrelated things out of the Transportation Trust Fund. We doubled our investment in the Port Priority Program. That's going to be $300 million more over the course of my first term for transportation infrastructure. Congressman? Well, Mark, you're exactly right. Roads are crumbling. We flood every time it rains. Traffic comes to a standstill in major cities. I mean, you just can't move. We have to reform the Department of Transportation from the top down. The pensions and the administrative cost of the Transportation Trust Fund, what is our gas tax money? It, it needs to go before the legislature so there can be some oversight. Right now, the DOTD treats it like a piggy bank, and it's not being used effective, effectively. It is not prioritized. We have got to move in a different direction if we're going to fix this problem. It is a $14 billion debacle. We've got to have leadership from the top. We've got to figure out how much money we actually have. As of today, we don't have a clue. Mr. Rasponi. Yes, uh, we all know our infrastructure is in bad shape, and we need to do something different. We have to do something different. And one of the things is that we're taking the tax dollars that we told the, the citizens, the gas tax dollars, and we're spending it on salaries and benefits. We need to stop that. We need to take that $130 plus billion dollars and put it in roads and bridges and match it with the federal funds, and now we're talking about another three or $400 million. The other thing is our capital outlay. We need to make it a point to take a certain amount of our capital outlay, again, maybe $130 million or whatever, again, parlay with federal dollars and come up with another three or $400 million. So now we're looking at about $800 million a year. Then we need to look at our Department of Transportation and make sure that we're spending the money wisely there and go forward with that. What we also need to do is make sure we take the politics out of all this. We've got to make sure that the projects, that we have a feasibility study, and it's a cost-benefit for it. Take the politics out of it and move our state forward. That's what we have to do to build the confidence in the citizens that we're spending their money where we say we're going to spend it, roads and bridges. Well, we're talking about whether the inefficiencies in DOTD and their budget's, uh, what, $586 million. Right. If you shut it down, if you sent all 4,500 of those employees off to perdition, you're still $13.5 billion short. Where are we going to get the money? Gas tax? Tolls? Where? Edwards, Governor? Well, first of all, we do have a highway priority program, and the legislature has complete input into it. Uh, we are more resource constrained than we ought to be, and the task force reported in 2017 the bill couldn't get a vote on the floor in 2017 or in 2019. I'm going to work with the legislature and the leadership uh, to make sure that we do have a more reliable and sustainable funding source so that we can tackle uh, the backlog. Anyone else? Can oh. Go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead, Congressman. Congressman. Look, Mark, we don't know what we don't know. We don't know how much money is moving around there because we have no accountability. The legislature does not have authority at this point to work on or look over our gas tax. We don't know. So, yes, let's, uh, let's bring them in and let's see what we got. Mr. Responi? Yes, I, uh, we have to do some things different. I mean, what other states are doing is what we need to be looking at as well. The, you know, they're using some of their sales tax on automobiles and automobile repair. They have a ceiling that once they reach that, they move it into the, their, their highways and bridges. 
So we have to look at some things and be creative. But again, we have to know where we're spending the dollars, make sure we've got the confidence of our citizens, and spend the money wisely. That's what you do as a business person. The next question is from Natasha, and it goes to Congressman Abraham. Congressman Abraham, we've had a number of questions submitted by the public about early childhood education. Early education, particularly for young children, is expensive, but data shows it can pay huge dividends in student performance down the road. If elected, what would you propose in education budgeting to respect to early child care and education for young children over the next four years? Look, as that family doctor, I've had to chase that little two-year-old around my exam room, put him on my lap, listen to his heart, looking in his ear. And at that age, they've got light in their eyes. I see that same child, five or six, that light's gone out because they did not have that early childhood education. We've got to improve access. We've got 3,000 families waiting to get to that program. But this administration hasn't put any new money to it until this year. It's an election year. We have got to have access. We've got to have those opportunities. And with those great high-quality opportunities has to come accountability. You're right. These are our future. These are our hearts. And we need to find the funding, which we will, and we need to nurture, challenge, and educate them so that they become good, productive students. Mr. Spony? Uh, yes, I think we, you know it's not something we're always looking forward to, but we've we made some changes in our child care centers would help prepare those young children for when they do become in kindergarten, so they're more prepared. That was a good step in the right direction. Now I think we need to continue to furnish fun early childhood development. That's very important because we all recognizing that it's, they're not getting it home, so we need to do a better job of ourselves. We don't have a choice. We have to give these children a chance. We have to hedge, get them prepared for kindergarten. So when they go in there, they'll be more prepared and have a future in education. West Feliciana did that. They did that several years back, and they were very, very successful with it. And so we have examples of how it works. We just need to step up and do it and make sure it happens all over. We have a good pattern. We know it works. Let's do it. Let's fund it and get started. Governor Edwards. Uh, thank you very much for the question, Natasha. Um, as I've said many times over the last year, early childhood education will be my number one priority for additional education funding in a second term. And we actually made a down payment on that this year. There's $20 million more being invested in early childhood education this year than last year. Um, and you cannot invest what you do not have until we fixed our budget deficit and got the growth that we needed out of our economy uh, and stabilize the budget, quite simply, you couldn't do that. But we actually had a task force, a commission that came together, multidisciplinary to study this, and they came back with a report that says the total new investment needs to be about $86 million a year. Uh, we are going to move in that direction uh, over the course of this second term because 80% of a child's brain development happens in the first five years. I don't care if someone lives to be 100, that's going to be the case. And so you can't wait until they show up at kindergarten to start teaching them. Uh, and so making sure between ages zero and three especially, they have quality early childhood education is the key to eliminating achievement gaps and producing better educational outcomes. So you're talking about dedicating at least $86 million over the course of oh, your term? Uh, at least that over the course of the term, additional funding. And, and look, if we can go beyond that, we certainly will as well. Anyone else care to respond to the amount of money they would dedicate to early childhood education? It's got to be a top priority. They are our future. And what we do is we are losing entire generations by not challenging them, by not educating them, not giving them that structure that they need to grow. So we'll find the money. Yeah, I'm, I have to speak to that again. I mean, we keep talking about money, money, money. We raised taxes $5 billion in the last four years. Every time we talk about it, a politician says, just give me more money, raise taxes. We can fix this without constantly raising taxes. We just need to prioritize it. We need someone that's an outsider, a conservative, a business person that knows how to run something. We got a $30 billion budget. We got to have somebody that goes in there and, and quit talking about raising taxes, growing government. Let's fix what we have. Let's get the confidence of our citizens that we can spend their money wisely and prioritize it. And this is a priority, and we need to address it accordingly. So now we're going to shift our questions a bit with our reporters asking questions directly to a specific candidate. 
The candidate will have one minute to answer, and panelists will have the opportunity for a follow-up, and the candidate will have another 20-second response. Greg Hilburn will start the questioning uh, for Mr. Risponi. Mr. Risponi, you've made immigration of undocumented workers and related issues like sanctuary cities a key platform. President Trump's administration has said Louisiana doesn't have any sanctuary cities. Our undocumented worker population is estimated to be less than 2 percent. So what specific incidents have you observed that lead you to believe it's a crisis in Louisiana? Well, first of all, I don't think his administration said we don't have a sanctuary city. Yes, uh, John, the Kennedy, John Kennedy said that was misstated, and he was there when they were talking about it with Mitch Landrieu. But let me say this. We have a sanctuary city in New Orleans. Anytime you have a city that funds a protest against ICE, the agency, the people that we hire to protect us, our citizens, and to put criminals aside that break our law, that's a sanctuary city in my mind, and that's a sanctuary city in everyone's mind. So let's, let's clear that up right off the bat. But now what I'm going to tell you is that I'm going to support our, our president when it comes to building a wall, doing away with sanctuary cities, and going after these gangs. You know, sanctuary cities encourage illegal immigration. They threaten our safety, and they're a tax burden on us. They're a burden on our hard-earned tax dollars. So we need to do something different. And I heard that we don't have that problem in Louisiana. We have 70,000 illegals in Louisiana. The second, that's the sixth largest city in Louisiana. We do have an issue, and we have to address that. And we have to support this president when it comes to that. This is usually would generally be considered a federal issue. And I understand that there are probably many people agree with you in, in your opinion. But how, as governor of Louisiana, could you have an impact in building the wall or are those things, some of those things that Greg, you Greg, that's a great question. I'm glad you brought it up. You know, let me say this. Florida, Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, and Texas all have a law that if a city does not follow the immigration laws and doesn't support, doesn't support those that are here to protect us, they don't get state funding. They pass those laws in those states. And it just so happened all of them have a Republican governor. And I'll do the same thing here in Louisiana. Mark Ballard now has a question for Governor Edwards. Governor, you tout a record of accomplishments, but Louisiana still ranks very low when compared to other states and on many of these lists, uh, high poverty rates, for instance. Why isn't that a reason to turn you out of office? Because the state of Louisiana is doing much better than it was four years ago on just about every relevant measure. The economy of our state today is the largest it has ever been, Mark, and growing at the tenth fastest rate in the nation. Personal income is the highest it has ever been. Uh, unemployment is at a 12-year low, 4.3 percent, two percentage points lower than when I became governor. And we are making, for the first time in 10 years, uh, strategic investments in our critical priorities, like the first teacher pay raise, like the first new investment in higher education. Uh, we, we have the lowest percentage of people ever in the state who are uninsured with respect to health insurance, uh, for example. Uh, so we are moving forward on a number of fronts. Our state is measurably, demonstrably much better off than we were four years ago, and that is exactly why the people of Louisiana should and will return me to office. But we still have one in five of our neighbors who are in poverty and have been for years. Correct. For, for generations. But the way you attack that is by pers uh, increasing personal income. That's what we're doing in Louisiana. It's the highest it has ever been. And you also do that by helping people access health insurance so that they can remain healthy and stay in the workforce and support themselves and their families. Natasha now has the next question for Congressman Abraham. Congressman Abraham, between 2014 and 2018, Louisiana experienced a 49 percent increase in drug-involved deaths, and the number of opioid-involved deaths in Louisiana was 184 times higher in 2018 than in 2012. As a physician, what level of responsibility do you feel health care professionals who prescribe opioids and pharmacies that fill those prescriptions play in opioid addiction in our state? The opioid crisis and the addiction rate and the death rate is, is horrific. Physicians play a vital role as far as monitoring those patients, making those patients accountable for the drugs that they take and certainly making them come back to clinic 
make sure that the opioids are working if they are so prescribed. The pharmacies, we have what's called a patient monitoring program in Louisiana, and it's a good one because what it does, it allows the pharmacy and the physician to see which patients are on which drugs and if they are actually using them the proper way. So the role of a family doctor like myself that does prescribe the opioids for patients on certain conditions for sure, we make sure that one, they're working, two, that they're doing what they need to do short term and long term, and three, that that patient is using them wisely and judiciously in the right manner. Well, it's been shown that patients have gone to a number of different doctors. They've shopped for doctors. They've taken the prescriptions that were given to relatives because they're so uh, basically out there in every medicine cabinet. So how do you stop that as far as the number of prescriptions that are being written by doctors such as yourself when you were writing? Look, we, we monitor the patients and we monitor those that come into our clinic, look on the patient, Man the management program, and it will tell us very quickly if they're doctor shopping, if they're compliant, and if they hopefully are using it in the right manner. So look, you have to be vigilant. You have to, you are the gatekeeper for that patient, and it is an important role, and look, as a physician, I take that very seriously. Well, that concludes two rounds of questioning. Now we have a question from the president of the Student Government Association here at ULL and a political science major, Rachel uh, Lotigard. Let's hear that As question. governor, what would you do to create broader job opportunities to entice a graduating student like me to stay in Louisiana and work or to return to Louisiana to work after earning a postgraduate degree in another state? Mr. Risponi. That's a great question. I really appreciate you, you asking that question. Let me say this. I'm the only candidate up here that's a job creator. I'm the only candidate up here that's always supported Donald Trump. And I'm the only candidate up here is an outsider, a conservative outsider. And I know how to create jobs. I've done that for 40 years. We started our business with three people in my living room, and today we employ almost 4,000 families. I know how to create jobs. I know how to work with job creators. I know what they need to exist and to grow in Louisiana. And I'll do that as your governor. And I know how to fill those jobs with Louisiana citizens. I've done it through education and training. So I will continue to do that. I'm the only job creator running for governor of Louisiana. We need someone that's an outsider, conservative, someone that knows how to create jobs. And that's what I'll do for Louisiana. Louisiana is the only state losing jobs. We're the only state in the country losing jobs. And I'm, I'm going to turn that around and make it happen. We, we should be the number one state in the South when it comes to jobs and opportunities. And I'm going to do that for our future generations, for our children and grandchildren can stay here and be proud to call Louisiana home. Governor? Yep. <laughs> you know, you're entitled to your opinion, but not to your own facts. The fact of the matter is, if you look at the U.S. Bureau of Economic Analysis and the Department of Labor, we are gaining jobs every year right now. In fact, our unemployment rate is 4.3 percent, a 12-year low. Uh, the key is education and training. Uh, and that's what employers want to know before they make an investment decision in Louisiana, is the talent pipeline in place so that they will be successful with that investment. Uh, and that is why we have been successful in landing 170 major economic development project wins with more than $41 billion of capital investment and 34,000 jobs, yes, created, new jobs here in Louisiana. And, and we're going to continue to do that. We are investing in education again. For the first time in 10 years, a net new investment in community colleges, technical colleges, and our universities, including ULL right here in Lafayette. <laughs> <laughs> Congressman Abraham. Well, let me dispel a rumor right quick. I've been a doctor, a farmer, a veterinarian, own three separate businesses. So, Eddie, I know how to hire people. And as far as being an outsider, I mean, you've been in politics a long time, Eddie. You've given millions to politicians. I've only been in there five years. So let's get that straight about this career politician and this outsider. It's, it's just not right. You know it. To answer the young lady's question, 
we've got to incentivize her to come, have a business, have her have some tax credits where she can form that business, build that business, and then she becomes an employer. We know that the frivolous lawsuits are out of control. We know our tax structure is too complicated, too many, and too high. We, those have to come down. Legal climate has to get better. And I would welcome a young person like that to come back in this state. Well, the next round of questions is our candidate to candidate questions. Uh, the order and pairings were determined earlier by drawing. Each candidate will ask an opponent a question. The opponent, opponent will have one minute to respond, and then the questioner will have 30 seconds for a final rebuttal. So we start with Mr. Rasponi, who will go first with a co uh, question to Congressman Abraham. Well, I want to ask the Congressman here, you know, I want to ask him to explain to me why you released a statement where you said that Donald Trump should drop out of the race against Hillary Clinton three weeks before the election. Eddie, I'm glad you're eye to eye, man to man. Right. Now look, I know that your consultants out of state have told you that you have to attack me and my family in order to win. But you know, you know those ads you're running against me and my family are lies. I don't vote with Pelosi. Those bills support our troops, they support our police, and they support our businessmen. I am the most conservative congressman that you will ever see. You know that the target that we should be working on is the one standing to your left. But when you stand up here and tell blatant lies to the good people of Louisiana, you're the politician, not me. Now, to your question, I have supported, and you know this, our wonderful president from the day he has been elected, and even before that, you know that. I have fought in the trenches with him. I've actually stood side by side when we passed some we're of these of, hard bills. I didn't put of, just a bumper sticker on my car, Eddie, after I'm We're out of time on that one. Mr. Rasponi, if, if you care to respond. Well, he didn't answer the question. Did he didn't answer. explain it to me. <laughs> All right. Well, if you it's go back to it's October, October the 8th, 2016, in The Advocate, he had a written statement where he, he said that Donald Trump should step aside. And, and then I'm saying that I, I'm the only candidate that has always supported Donald Trump. We have one here that was a superdelegate to Hillary Clinton, and we got one here that's asking Donald Trump and saying he should drop out of the race against Hillary Clinton. Can you imagine where we'd be today if Hillary Clinton was our president? That's the point I'm can trying I, to make. Can I, can I respond to that? No, you can't. No, I think we have to move on. So, lies. so our next question is from Representative Abraham and is for Governor Edwards. Governor. On the last debate, we heard that you had hired a senior staffer with a history of sexual harassment against women. This week, we've learned that, only, that not only did your Department of Health send a sexually explicit questionnaire to very young children, but your two appointed Bessie board members voted to allow a teacher into a Louisiana classroom who had just lost his teaching certificate in Georgia for sending sexually inappropriate text messages to a minor. The question to you, Governor, why haven't you called for their resignations, and how can parents trust you to ensure that their children are safe in Louisiana classrooms? Because the people of Louisiana know me, Senator. I'm, I'm sorry, Congressman. That's why. They know that I have a long history of public service dating back to when I was 17 years old and went to West Point. And they know that I will get up and work hard every single day to move our state forward and to make sure that everyone is safe. And, and if you go out and you talk to people of Louisiana, uh, they will confirm what I just told you. That is their appreciation of me, and it is accurate uh, because of the work that I have put in over the course of my life, not just as a legislator, but also as governor and as a soldier uh, before that. Uh I mean, I'm, I'm just asking, why didn't you call for those two Bessie board members' resignations well, when they allowed, were going to allow a known possible person to be in a call? I will find out what they knew and what they did and when they knew it in relationship to whatever decision, uh, decision that they made with respect to their vote. And when I do that, 
I will then make a determination as to whether their resignation is appropriate or not. Well, please look into it. Well, I, I, will, I do my job, Congressman. You're the one who doesn't please, do yours. Please, please look into I, it. I do my job. You don't have to admonish me. I go to work I, every single day. Every single day. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks to both of you. I think the next and final candidate to candidate question is from Governor Edwards to uh, Congressman Abraham. Or Mr. Responi, I'm sorry, sorry. I'd be glad to let him have yeah, it. Yeah, I know. Come on. Come on. <laughs> Bring it on. Mr. Responi, you spent years praising Bobby Jindal, um, and you backed that praise up with thousands of dollars in political contributions all the way up through and including 2015. And even when he ran for president, after it was obvious uh, that he had destroyed our economy, run the state into the ditch. So given your support of Bobby Jindal and his failed policies, how can the people of Louisiana trust you uh, well, not to take them back to the days of record deficits, dishonest budgeting, and the largest disinvestments in education in the United States of America? Thank you for that question. Let me say this, folks. Bobby Jindal's not running for governor. I'm running for governor, and we're going to keep going back to that. You know, we, and I hear it over and over again. And I would like to correct him. I did not support Bobby Jindal for president. That's a misstatement, and that's an exaggeration. So all I'm telling you is Bobby Jindal's not running for governor. I'm running for governor. I'm an outsider. I'm a conservative. I am, some, I am the only one on this stage as an outsider, conservative, and someone with serious business skills, and someone that's not beholden to special interests. That's what I am. I'm the only one. And I want to turn this state around. It's time to get someone that's not a career politician to move our state forward. They've had their opportunities on both sides of the aisle. And I'm going to make sure that we move our state forward. You know, I have had an opportunity. I've taken advantage of it. We are moving forward. There was a $2 billion deficit when I became governor, uh, the largest in our state's history. But because of the bipartisan work we've been able to accomplish, we've righted the ship. We pulled ourselves out of the ditch. And we simply cannot go backwards. And the fact of the matter is, if you actually listen to what Mr. Responi, and for that matter, Congressman Abraham, too, they are prescribing going back to the very same policies of Bobby Jindal that failed us so miserably. The people of Louisiana are not going to go back. I assure you, we're going forward in Louisiana. All right. Thank you all very much. And now we're going to turn things back over to our journalist. And the next question is from LPB's Natasha Williams. And it begins, it goes to Congressman Abraham. Natasha. Congressman Abraham, uh, 241 death sentences given in Louisiana since 1976. There were 28 executions, 129 inmates had their sentences reduced, 11 of which were found not guilty and released from prison. Louisiana has a higher than average percentage of death row inmates who are exonerated than the rest of the nation. As governor, will you advocate resuming executions using other methods or measures or eliminating the death penalty altogether? Tasha, I'm the only candidate up here that supports the death penalty, and I would add child molesters to that list. Now, we thank you. We have a criminal justice issue that we need to discuss, and certainly the definition of a violent versus nonviolent criminal between the governor and I is worlds apart. If you've committed a violent crime. And let's say you just got picked up yesterday for shoplifting. In my opinion, you're still a violent criminal. And under my administration, if you're a violent criminal, you're going to serve every second of your sentence. Now, we all agree that nonviolent offenders, they certainly deserve a second chance, and I want to give it to them. But as far as those that are on death row, that we've made 110 percent sure that they're the guilty party, yes, I will, uh, I will uh, start. Uh, you plan allow, to start executions again? I, I would allow those executions to go forward. Mr. Responi. Uh, let me say this. I mean, my heart and prayers go out to anyone that's a victim of a capital crime. I really do. And the families, that is a traumatic thing to go through. And I would pray for them because it's got to be just awful to go through that. But my, my Christian faith says I am pro-life. So I'm against the capital punishment in that light. You know, I just, I just can't 
do that because of my Christian faith. So that's where I stand on that. I'm not afraid to say that because of my Christian faith. But my heart goes out to anyone that's a victim of a capital crime, you know, and we have to do something different. We have to, we have to create a society where we don't have this going on. We have to work on mental illness. We have to work on drug abuse. abuse. We have to do something different to, to prevent those crimes of capital punishment. So let's work on that, folks. That's what I'll do. And I'm going to create jobs. I'm going to improve our education. And we're going to do things different. We're going to try to keep people out of prison. You know, work on those things. But I am against the capital punishment because of my faith. But again, my heart goes out to those who suffer from it. Governor? Well, it, when I became governor, I, I took an oath to make sure that I would faithfully execute the laws of the state of Louisiana. One of those laws happens to be capital punishment. Uh, you don't get to pick and choose. Uh, and so I'm going to do that. I will faithfully execute the laws of the state of Louisiana. It just so happens there's litigation ongoing in federal court, and there is a federal court stay on executions in Louisiana. Uh, and we also have an inability to acquire the drugs to be used in lethal injections, which is the only prescribed method for executions in Louisiana. Uh, because no manufacturer will sell them to us for that purpose. And in fact, they have threatened to sue Louisiana if we use them uh, for executions. And to get to the second part of your question, I am 100 percent opposed to going back to methods of execution that have been previously discarded by the state of Louisiana because it was believed to be uh, cruel, unusual, or somewhat barbaric. That's not something that I support. Because you say that you support the laws of Louisiana, um, will you help move the process forward to get the necessary legal methods that are well, being? Well, first of all, the state of Louisiana, through the governor's office, is defending the statute in the federal court now. Mm -hmm. uh, we are doing that uh, actively as, as, as we sit here or stand here tonight. It's been a long process, though. Is there it is. And there's only been one execution, I might have my, my year slightly wrong, I think in 16 or 17 years uh, because of, of the problems that I just went through with you. Uh, but it remains a law on the books. I took an oath to the laws of the state of Louisiana and we're gonna do what we can do. Our next question is from Greg Hilburn and it goes to Mr. Rispone. Thank you. All keep of you have said, get, keep getting a short straw, Greg. I know. <laughs> All of you have said you intend to grow some government programs like childhood, early childhood education. But what you haven't said is which programs you would cut to offset the increased spending. And two of you have said you will also cut taxes. How can you increase spending without making cuts and while actually reducing revenue? That doesn't seem to add up even using common core math. <laughs> Mr. Sponey. Appreciate you throwing that in there. Well, let me say this, you know, again, uh, we have to do something different, and it's going to take someone, a CEO. We have a $30 billion operation, and we keep electing politicians to be our governor. It's time to get a business person, an outsider, someone that has some serious business skills. It's a $30 billion operation, folks. We need a CEO. So that's the first step. The second thing is we, we passed a law in 2018. We have what they call Louisiana checkbook. It's supposed to show where every dollar is spent in our state agencies. And that we could have got that done for $350,000 in, in three months. But what do we do? We, our administration decides to spend $26 million and take five years to do that. So this day, we don't know where we're spending all our money. So if you're a business person or in your own personal Household, you have to know where you're spending money. That's where we're going to find it. We're going to be able to manage it, have a budget, decide where we're going to do it, and prioritize where we spend our dollars. It's a simple process, but you're going to need a CEO. Governor Edwards. Well, that was the Bobby Jindal answer. We're going to do more with less. That's what he always said. If you can always do more with less, one day you can do everything for nothing. And the world doesn't work that way. Let me tell you about taxes. When I became governor, we had the fifth lowest combined state and local tax burden in the country according to the Tax Foundation. Today, we have the fifth lowest combined state and local tax burden in the country. Uh, we're going to continue uh, to work to make sure that we're doing everything that we can to be accountable uh, with the dollars that we have. And yes, we're going to continue to bring our federal tax dollars home. 
uh, because that's where the growth in the budget has been since I've been governor, principally for the Medicaid expansion. And I will not apologize for bringing our federal tax dollars back to Louisiana to take care of Louisiana working people and make sure that they have health insurance so that they can work, have productive lives, have healthy lives, and in many cases, get an opportunity to live. Thank you, Congressman Abraham. Well, we've got blame, blame, blame Bobby. We've got Eddie here saying that you've got to be sitting in a boardroom to know how to run a business. Well, Eddie running a farm, running a doctor's office, running an aviation business, you know, I, I've done pretty good at business too. But the problem is in Louisiana is we don't have a revenue problem, Greg. We do have a spending problem. And the way to get that back is to bring jobs in. You create the jobs. As you know, we are the only state in the union that lost jobs in the last 12 months. You get the jobs that back. That is just a false statement. That is, that's your Bureau of Labor Statistics, no, Governor. Sir. Yes, it no, is. Uh, let me finish. Let, put my time back yeah. on that clock. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> we create the jobs. You have more people actually pulling the cart than riding in the cart. What a novel idea. That's the way you solve this problem. Well, all due respect, none of you, you, you all very much sounded like politicians then because <laughs> all of you still said that you can grow some government programs, which is laudable programs, and none of you have said that w where you would cut, and some have said you would reduce revenue. It just doesn't seem to make sense. Can I yes, comment sir? on that? I appreciate that. It's a matter of prioritizing. That's what we're talking about. You know, we still don't have transparency. We still don't have the Louisiana checkbook where we know we're spending money. Our state auditor had to sue the Department of Health because they refused to give them information to see where they spent. They wasted $85 million. And the auditor wanted to see why did that happen. Well, we comparing people's salaries and what their wages were so they could get on the Medicaid. So it, you ask, that's $85 million right there. And a lot of that's federal money, but we still spend Thank it on you. Thank you. Transparency. <clears throat> The fact of the matter is the auditor sued to get information the legislature had told the Department of Health it would be illegal to provide. That's, that's what he's talking about. But I have four years as a record, Greg, as to what I would uh, spend money on, how we're going to prioritize that. Uh, and we are out of the ditch. We, were, we had an unstable situation okay. for nine years with Thank deficits. You, we now have surpluses. Thank you, Governor. Uh, Congressman Abraham, I one last word I just want to say Senator here. Kennedy and I have introduced a bill to try to get some transparency from the governor as far as the Medicaid expansion problem because there is waste, fraud, and abuse. And look, I treat those good patients, and I want them to get the care that they deserve and they need. But we've got to get the uh, people that are not supposed to be on the rolls off and get those people that need the rolls. But the governor said, his office said, well, we'll get to you a couple of days after the election. How novel. Well, Mark, you have, we're changing topics. You have another question for our candidates, oh, and it goes okay. to Governor Edwards. <laughs> well, <clears throat> there are a number of studies from the federal government, from the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, that say the trade war with China is uh, going to have a $7 billion negative impact on Louisiana's economy. Uh, it's the fourth highest uh, dollar amount in the country, and that's because uh, exports make up about a, a quarter of uh, our this, this state's economy. Do you believe that the tariffs imposed by the U.S. government are hurting Louisiana? And what do you plan to do to prepare for that loss in helping Louisiana businesses and in the state general fund? Well. I do believe that, and I will tell you what I told the president, both in a letter that I wrote him and in a visit that I made with him in New Jersey. Um, and this was substantiated by both a Bloomberg report and a CNBC report that said of all 50 states, the one that would be the biggest loser from a protracted trade war and global instability with respect to markets would be the state of Louisiana. Uh, and so I just encouraged him uh, to do everything he could to be successful in these negotiations, but actually get to a point where uh, we are back without the, the trade wars and, and the instability that have been caused by what's going on principally with China, but, but elsewhere as well, because we export 60 percent of the nation's grain from our ports in Louisiana. Uh, and when there are not markets for that grain, there are not uh, exports to be made. We also import a lot of steel and aluminum. And the biggest problem we're having now is trying to get the 
offtake agreements for LNG out of China because they've stopped signing those contracts. So I just want him to thank be successful, but as quickly as possible. Thank, thank you, Governor. Congressman Abraham. Oh, absolutely. We've been hurt by the tariffs, but let me tell you, our farmers are patriots. They are taking it on the chin, but they stand with this president, as I do, because we know China's manipulated currency. We know they have unfair trade practices, and they know we know they steal our intellectual property. How do we fix that? We could get the Democrats, with Speaker Pelosi, to actually bring the USMCA, the new NAFTA, up for a vote. That would be a tremendous win for Louisiana. But because she will not do it, because she doesn't want to give President Trump a win, she won't do it. And guess who on this stage didn't sign a letter pushing for that to be done? I'll, I'll leave it up to you to decide. Well, our Mr. Rispone, have you? Well, I have to say this, you know, I, this is, and y'all might keep this. I have to agree with both of them on this. I think the governor, I think we, we do need to encourage our president to keep moving forward and solve our problems because we can't let them to continue to take advantage of us. But again, it's a, it's a, it's a negotiation. Our president is a businessman. He's been in tough negotiation before. You just don't walk in there with your hat in hand, say, please, would you mind doing it right? It doesn't work that way. So we got a good negotiator, a strong guy that's doing that for our country to turn this thing around so we won't be taken advantage of in the future. That's what we need to be doing. And again, we need to encourage him to keep it and move as fast as he possibly can. But again, this is, this is doing the right way. So in the long run, we're going to be better off as a country. Our farmers are going to be better. Our manufacturing will be better. And we won't be taken advantage of. And I support the president in what he's doing. Our final round here is our lightning round, where we'll pose a series of questions to the candidates that can be answered very simply with a yes or no answer very, very quickly. So we're going to start with Congressman Abraham. Bring it on. All right. Okay. <clears throat> the first lightning round. Should the legislature be in charge of redistricting? Yes. 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 Would you roll back Medicaid expansion? Mr. Spone. I, w I would say this. We have to make it. Nope. Yes or no. <laughs> would you roll back Medicaid expansion? I would have to say no. Governor? No. No. Okay. Do you support universal background checks for gun sales, Governor Edwards? I, for all commercial sales, yes. No. No. Would you support an increase in the minimum wage? Governor. <laughs> I do, and I have. <laughs> Congressman. No. No. Do you believe climate change is caused by human activity? Congressman Abraham. That's a tough one now. <laughs> it, you can't answer that with a yes or no. Uh, no to the most part. No. 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 Mr. Spoon. Government. Yes, human behavior certainly contributes to climate change. Okay. <laughs> All right. So our final he, yes or no. He clarified it, okay? He can <laughs> clarify. That's what he said. It's either yes or no. You told us that. I, I did. Yes okay. or no. All right. Now, here, here's one you all can answer. In honor of the recent PBS series, if you've been watching it or not, who is your favorite country music artist? Mr. Esponi, it's your turn. It's your turn. <laughs> you know... <laughs> I like Colin Ray. I'm sorry. That's who I like. Who? Colin Ray. Okay. Go. George Jones, and He Stopped Loving Her Today is my favorite song. Okay. <laughs> All right. Congressman Ingram. Garth Brooks. Okay. All right. <laughs> well, thank you all so very much. Um, yes. All right. Yeah, we now move to our closing, our closing statements. And because we're a little bit uh, short on time, we're only going to have 30 seconds to go with these. But we're going to start with Mr. Rispone. Well, all I have to say is that I'm the only conservative in this race. I'm the only one that supported Donald Trump all the time, never backed off of him, from him. And I'm the only one that's has serious business skills to turn our state around. We have to do something different, folks. We've been last too long. And it needs some drastic changes. We need to hire a CEO over our $30 billion operation and someone that was not beholden to special interest, someone would move our state forward. And I'm asking you for your support, and I'm asking you for your vote, and of course, I'm most of all, I'm asking you for your prayers. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Governor.
Governor Edwards. <laughs> Governor. Thank you. When I took office, the state of Louisiana had the largest budget deficit in our history. It exceeded $2 billion. But we did the hard bipartisan work that was necessary to right the ship, to strengthen our economy, to grow jobs, and now we've turned that deficit into a surplus, and we are finally making strategic investments in things like health care, higher education. Now is not the time to turn back. Our best days are ahead of us, but only if we will continue to put Louisiana ahead of party. So I'm asking for your prayers and I'm asking for your vote so we can continue to move Louisiana forward. And Congressman Abraham. Well, both, of, both of my opponents have spent millions of dollars attacking me. Why? Because we're winning. But look, I'm not trying to buy the election. I'm not a career politician and I'm certainly not a liberal Democrat. But let me tell you who I am. I'm a veteran, I'm a farmer, I'm a family doctor, and I'm a Christian man. I ask for your vote because I know we can win, and I know we can move this state forward in a good direction. What I can tell you, help is on the way. Well, thank you, thank you. And gentlemen, thank you all for participating. Thank you all for being here, our reporters. Thank you in the audience. Let's have a round of applause for everyone. Thank you. And thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Uh, all right. We would like to offer our special thanks to uh, Dr. Joseph Savoy. We'd like to thank the folks here at UL, Dr. Uh, Joseph Savoy, his staff, the students, all the folks here for making us so welcome and making this such a, a great debate for us to be able to be a part of. Also, thanks to you, our studio audience, to uh, the folks who are watching as viewers, and of course, to you, the candidates, for your participation. And remember, you can see what others are saying about the debate and join the conversation by following it on Twitter at hashtag LAGovDebate. You can also watch a repeat of tonight's debate at lpb.org slash debate. And behalf of us at the Council for a Better Louisiana and Louisiana Public Broadcasting, we thank you for joining us tonight and have a good evening. Good evening. <laughs> Major production funding for the Louisiana Governor's Debate 2019 is provided by Southern Strategy Group, supporting voter education and providing professional advice on the politics of business and the business of politics. With over 100 years of combined partner experience, navigating governmental affairs, Learn more at SSGLA.com and by the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting and viewers like you.